Welcome to the Student Affairs One Thing, a podcast that asks a simple question of seasoned student affairs professionals. What is one thing you have learned that has helped shape your professional career? I'm your host, Stuart Brown, the developer of studentaffairs.com, one of the most accessed websites by student affairs professionals. On our pages, we have the most cost-effective job posting board, listing hundreds of open student services positions, and a wide range of webinars. On today's episode, I am very pleased to have Dr. Elizabeth Thompson, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs and Director of the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Intercultural Programs at the University of Minnesota, Morris. Welcome to the program, Liz. Thanks for having me. So Liz, what is your one thing? My one thing is disability justice. So disability justice, one of the principles of disability justice, which is intersectionality and how that has connects to my life. Can you give a description for listeners that might not understand what that means? Intersectionality also comes from legal black scholar, feminist Kimberly Crenshaw. And it's really acknowledging and recognizing the power differences and the connections when someone has intersecting identities. And so originally it connected with race, ethnicity, and gender. And now it's been expanded towards additional identities, such as, but not limited to, disability, immigrant status, sexual orientation. Is there a story behind this being your one thing? I did my undergraduate at a private liberal arts college north of Chicago. And the experiences that I had then after, which then was in Chicago, predominantly in the Rogers Park area, which is very diverse in a variety of different ways. And so although I had already had my identity development, I'd say pretty solidly around being a Vietnamese adoptee and also a feminist, being in Chicago really got me introduced to more of the diverse Asian American Pacific Islander communities, as well as the broader LGBTQIA plus communities. And so I was also then working at the Gender and Sexuality Center at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And I was really steeped in the diverse LGBTQIA plus communities. And then I got introduced more to the Asian American Pacific Islander communities, also on the national front. So in short, there was a time that then many of my communities collided and I got to know folks who were both and. They were both and queer and Asian American Pacific Islander. They were both and Asian American Pacific Islander and disabled. And so while I felt really good and comfortable and affirmed when I was in a predominant space like the queer community, or I was in a predominant space in the Asian American Pacific Islander community or the disabled community, the times that I know that I really flourished and thrived as a person, and then also then my work in student affairs was when I was connected and surrounded by the community of queer, Asian American Pacific Islander, and also disabled. And so I found that through working with the National Queer Asian American Pacific Islander Alliance, and then also a number of disabled communities as well in Chicago. What would you recommend to individuals listening to the podcast that are thinking, you know, I, I share a lot of what Liz is talking about, but either in my area of the country, you know, sort of geography, I, I don't know how to connect. I don't know how to do what she did. So what could you recommend for those people? Yeah, that's a great question because now as I'm in rural, central, western Minnesota, working at the University of Minnesota Morris campus, that's hard and that's actually a reality for myself. So I would recommend that one, write it on a post-it note, make a poster or do something, but just remind yourself that you are not alone. You have community, even if physically or on your campus or in your small town, you think that you might be the only one. For me, being in central Western Minnesota. And while I do, I have really great colleagues. I do have some also great allies. I also have found a few people that also share 
at least one, if not sometimes two of my identities, but it's still really lonely and it's really isolating. In 2022, you know, I'm privileged to have really great access to the internet. And I probably increased my social media <laughs> viewing and connecting definitely in the past two years, but for sure in the past, I'd say five years after I left Chicago. I would imagine individuals could tap into the various professional associations. They might not always be the answer, but at least people can can start out the major associations, let's say the generalist ones, ACPA, NASPA, but there are a lot of, you know, there's a head for the disability community and, but they have knowledge groups and that you can really get yourself involved. But people have to do is make the effort. No one's going to knock on their door and say, well, here's a group to go into, or here's a group, but they have to sort of reach out. And like you said, with the internet, it's very easy to, to search out groups. Yeah, absolutely, Stu. I'm pretty involved in, I'd say, uh, mostly NASPA and then also ACPA, as well as the head. And then the other group, too, that I've really been uh, pleasantly surprised of just connecting because I'm not directly in campus activities anymore, although that was where I kind of got my start in student affairs, the ACUI. And so I would say, yeah, with those different knowledge and practice communities, the different SIGs or employment resource groups that might be on your campus that I honestly, sometimes I have to decide and choose, am I going to the disabled employee union or am I going to the Asian American Pacific Islander group? So, you know, capacity and just kind of emotional effort. And like you said, motivation, like I can't go to them all. And so I would also, you know, so the groups that I'm able to go to, we have our mission and purpose and we, you know, we do center our issues and concerns as well as we need to make time to also reach out to the other groups. And so that's also one of the principles of disability justice is collective access and collective liberation. And so absolutely, you know, within a head, our racial justice group, and then our disability studies group, and our queer group, and we are also so much stronger together when we can come together and do that reception or come together and go out for that coffee break together. Because I have to say, I mean, some of the younger professionals, they're looking for already that intersectionality and they don't want to choose between having to go to one group and not the other. They want to see that solidarity and allyship between the professional organizations and, and professional groups. Liz, thank you for sharing your one thing. I think this is so important, especially as we talk about community with COVID isolating us for so many years, we can say that plural that people are looking to connect. And there are communities out there. Sometimes it just takes a little effort to see what is out there. You have been listening to the Student Affairs One Thing, a podcast that asks a simple question of seasoned student affairs professionals. What is one thing you've learned that has helped shape your professional career? I want to thank today's guest, Dr. Elizabeth Thompson, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs and Director of the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Intercultural Programs at the University of Minnesota Morris. I've been your host, Stuart Brown, the developer of studentaffairs.com, one of the most accessed websites by student affairs professionals. I hope you will join us next time for another episode of the Student Affairs One Thing.